The Velvet Underground formed in New York during 1964, when John Cale, a classically trained musician from Wales, met Lou Reed, who was currently working as a staff songwriter for Pickwick Records. The pair quickly recruited Sterling Morrison on guitar and bass, and Mo Tucker on drums. Taking their name from Michael Lee's sadomasochistic novel, the band quickly attracted the attention of eccentric New York-based artist Andy Warhol. Warhol instantly became both a benefactor and an advocate for the group. We're sponsoring a new band. It's called The Velvet Underground. And uh, when, since I don't really believe in painting anymore, I thought it would be a nice way of combining, uh, and we have a chance to combine music and, and art and uh, uh, films all together. As well as providing the group with a stage on which to perform, Warhol also controversially introduced a second singer to the band. Nico, a beautiful Hungarian chanteuse, had recently arrived in New York from London, where she had recorded the Dylan song, I'll Keep It With Mine. On Warhol's insistence, she took lead vocals on several of the Velvet Underground songs. You gotta have a beautiful girl in it. And his, Nico was the beautiful girl, you know. So this whole thing of forcing that on the group and wedging it in with shoe horns and chisels and spikes, it came about and it worked, but like Lou had to be just about begged by Andy to do it. And, and so when we performed, you know, it was developed underground in Nico. Andy introduced her to us and I thought, I thought that the songs she did sing were perfect, but uh, we never intended that now it's the Velvet Underground and Nico. That it was just a, that was in our minds a temporary thing. Warhol and his entourage quickly developed what became known as the Exploding Plastic Inevitable, a multimedia show featuring a live performance from the band. Despite Warhol's promotional efforts, the band was still no closer to being signed. So while still performing nightly with the exploding plastic inevitable, the group made the unusual decision to record an album before securing a record contract. To facilitate the album's production, Warhol approached Norman Dolph, who was currently working for Columbia Records. I got involved with the Velvet Underground via Warhol. Because I was working for Columbia, uh, and they asked me if I knew how to get such a thing done. And I was working for the custom manufacturing division of Columbia, where they made records for Atlantic and Warners, and one of the accounts that I handled was Scepter. They had a studio office on uh, 54th Street. The guy that was their chief engineer was a guy named John Licata. He was a journeyman engineer for Scepter and would record whatever they had on the books. They'd record Gospel in the morning and Dionne Warwick in the afternoon and Marv Johnson at night. And, and they, they had a deal with, with Scepter that any time the studio wasn't booked, he could sell himself and the studio to outside clients and, and pocket the dough. The only restriction was he had to work around the stuff that Scepter was doing ordinarily. And that was their perk to him. And so we, we made an arrangement. Uh, I believe that the budget was 600 bucks, which was uh, essentially I believe to be two long days of recording, two or three. The whole thing took place, in my best recollection, over parts of four days in one week. I remember being in the studio the first time. Yeah, I was very excited. It was so different. I've never obviously done anything like that. John and Lou had, but that was totally new to me, and it was very exciting to be making a record. Um, and it, it was fun, but it was also nerve-wracking. We only had eight hours, so none of us wanted to mess it up or have to do it again or whatever, because we just didn't have the time for it. In the years since the album was recorded, some confusion has grown up around Andy Warhol's precise role in the record's production. Andy didn't play any role in the first record. Not a technical role. He was always a cheerleader, sort of, but which was great to have, but no, he, he didn't play any role. The musical decisions, I would say, were made in the, in the main by John Cale and Sterling in terms of the balance uh, or, uh, or feel-wise in nature. I would give them credit for it. 
I didn't have a last word on anything except to listen for things that sounded like m true mistakes. And somebody knocked over a, a music stand, or or you'd hear something that wasn't mixed right that you just clearly couldn't handle. And we'd look at Johnny, say, "Yeah, let's start it over." And we'd break the take down and start the thing over from the head. So in most of those songs, there is only one surviving take. There may be some some scraps, but uh, they were done and, and then people would come in and listen to it and they'd say either let's do it over from the top or let's buy it. And, uh, but the, they were mostly done in, in one complete shot takes. I think it affected the process uh, or the result um, favorably because we didn't have time for nonsense. We didn't have time to overdub a solo, for instance, or things like And I don't think even in those days you had four tracks or two or something, so. With the record complete, Dolph took a copy of the album and pitched it to his current employers at Columbia Records. At the end of the, uh, at the session, they did a, a mono mix, and uh, I took that uh, tape to Columbia, where we had an acetate cut. And that acetate was presented to Columbia's A&R department. I said, look, this is a new group sponsored by Andy Warhol, uh, radical new sound, making all kinds of waves in, uh, in the uh, East Village. And is this something Columbia's A&R department want to sign on for? And I got the acetate back in about 48 hours with a, with a memo saying, there's no way in the world any sane person would buy or want to listen or put anything behind this record. I, I passed it back to Warhol and Morrissey, and it's only about a year or a little more later does it surface on MGM Verve. Now, one thing that can never fully be known, I guess, or uh, uh, Lou Reed may be able to shed some light on it, but uh, Tom Wilson, the guy who was the spearhead of it at MGM Verve, had worked for Columbia at the time it was shown to Columbia. Now, I don't know whether his ears ever heard it at Columbia uh, and had an opinion on it or not. Tom Wilson is, is a very significant figure on the entire rock scene in the mid-60s. I mean, here is somebody whose who's real reputation within pop circles, of course, is as the producer of Bob Dylan, who, after all, is the cutting-edge figure at that point. When they first came into contact, he, he was still doing freelance work for Columbia, um, so the story goes, essentially, uh, he told them, no, wait, I'm going to MGM, to Verve, come with me. But what he would have had to work with in terms of the New York sessions, what they'd produced, Wilson seems to have pretty good instincts about what needed to be recut. They redid three songs. They did Waiting for the Man Again, they did Heroin, and they did Venus in Furs. Um, when they finished, Wilson decided that the record wasn't strong enough and he wanted a single and so that's when he, he asked them to write a single specifically for Nico and um, that would be Sunday Morning. Sunday Morning was released as a single in December 1966. However, it was not to feature Nico on lead vocals as Tom Wilson had wished. Sunday Brings the sort of a hallmark of Lou's relations with Nico at that point that he wrote the song and then when they got into the studio refused to let Nico sing it. You know, when they got there, Lou sang it in a voice that was so feminine, it, out, you know, it was more feminine than Nico could possibly have done. I think that may have been intentional on his part to pretty it up and say, you know, we don't need this girl singing, I can do it myself. So it was, it was a, an attempt really to get a single because they want it to be successful. It's not one of these things where we want to die in obscurity. We want to be played on the radio. We want people to buy our records. So let's give them something that is good and we love, um, but is, a, is accessible. And Sunday Morning is a beautiful, beautiful recording. People forget that while the Velvets were dark, they had a certain heroin chic about them, they were certainly decadent up to a point in a very streetwise manner. They did have songs like Sunday Morning, which had a very happy, happy, joy, joy pop theme to it. The thematics of the Velvet Underground weren't just trying to sort of push the envelope. They also realised that sometimes caressing the envelope could be even more effective. Although the Velvet Underground finished recording in May 1966, due to a variety of legal problems, 
the record was not released until 1967. This delay was further compounded by the record's exceptionally complicated sleeve design, which today has become as iconic as the music itself. I worked on the first album cover, but we did it as a group at the factory. Andy, Paul, Gerard, I mean, you know, we all contributed different images and what have you. And if you look on the credits on the Velvet Underground and Nico album, I'm listed as Billy Linick, which is who I was in the avant-garde art world before I became Billy Name of factory fame. One of the truly radical things that the album does, everyone forgets. If you open up the original album, it's got all these quotes about the band. The only thing is, 80% of them are really, really nasty. They hate the band. And the band, rather than actually burying these attacks on them, make them part of the album cover, which is a, an extraordinarily radical gesture. The album cover for the Velvet Underground and Nico is fun. It's a fun record. And that's not to say that it wasn't uh, calculated, because it's a banana. What does it look like? It looks like a penis, right? It's a big penis on a record. And then the, the addition of the, the temptation to want to peel this off is like, oh, what is underneath? And you're expecting something really nasty and dirty. And they go, oh, you know what it is? It's a pink banana underneath, right? Gotcha. <laughs> The Velvet Underground and Nico was released in March 1967, and although the record was famously ignored in its own time, it has since gone on to become recognised as one of the most innovative and unique recordings in modern music. The Velvet Underground and Nico is, is one of those literally handful of albums that you don't really see the precedence for. There are literally a handful in rock music where you, you put the album on, and you don't see where, what leads up to it. The, the, there is nothing that says, oh, and the next step is the Velvet Underground and Nico. And no matter how radical something may sound on first listening, most of the time, almost all of the time, you're going, ah, yeah, they've combined Beef Heart with the MC5, or, you know, that, that, that it's some kind of melange of, of things that have come before. Now, of course, no music is completely new, but I dare anybody to say that they heard Venus in Furs on Velvet Underground and Nico and went, ah, I can hear, that's uh, a bit of John Cage taken with Lamont Young, uh, mixed in with a little... No, it's just from nowhere. <laughs> I remember the first time I heard Venus and Furs, and it was the first time I heard the Banana album. And the first couple of tracks, I was with a couple of friends, we were listening to it in their parents' based on an old hi-fi with legs on it, really old thing. And I popped this record on, I had just purchased it, and as we're all talking, I'm sort of listening to it in the background. Then I hear Sunday morning, I'm like, okay, it sounds like a pop song. And I kind of, I'm sort of listening to the record and I'm listening to them, and I'm, and I'm sort of ignoring it until Venus and Furs comes on. And then suddenly everything else is shut out. Venus in Furs is the breakthrough. And I don't just mean in terms of the Velvet Underground. I mean in terms of rock music. Um, you know, the, it, it probably is the most important rock song since Heartbreak Hotel. You know, it, 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 because it essentially kicks open the door. It says you don't have to use the same three instruments. You don't have to talk about the same subject matters. And the fact that it would pick something as, as relatively dangerous as a Sacco Massox um, S&M novel from the 19th century as a subject, to do that in a pop song, you know, it's such an unimaginably radical gesture. Influenced by the music of John Cage and Lamont Young, Cale had brought these more experimental elements with him to his new band. this underlying avant-garde aesthetic that came from Cage and Lamont Young and Kale being part of that mindset of the, the long tone. That long tone 
uh, was the kale gift to the Velvet Underground. That haunting undertone, the underground tone. That sound was not a sound that I'd ever heard or that anybody had, that nyong, you know, which, it's more than a, it's an electrified viola, but once you know that's what it is, but otherwise it could be, you know, doom incarnate as far as the sound goes. John was, you know, very inventive and, and oh, let's do that and let me try this. And I think he, he had more, I think, more to do with um, the songs becoming what they were. Um, now, of course, Lou wrote them, so obviously he had a lot to do with it, too. But I think, you know, the final product, I think, had a lot, a lot more to do with John than people maybe realize.